Welcome to West of Tulsa. I'm C.J. Ward, and we are broadcasting from Ventura, California. We have most of the crew here. Beth still isn't with us. Boo. It, I'm, uh, trust me, she's around. <laughs> she's just working on other jobs that actually pay money. I think you're, so I think that's you're, why I she's think not you're hiding here. her from yeah, us. I know. So Beth isn't here, but we do have Helm's back. Welcome How back, you Helm. Thank you, guys. Yeah, it's been a while. He's been yeah. working, too. We'll tell you what he's been up to here in a bit. It's... And we got Gabe, and we got Yo. Dan. And our guest Yo. today, thank you for coming in. We got... Ralph and Ryan Gold from R and R Motorworks in Goleta, and you guys focus on Miatas, for the most part, right? Yes. I mean, you guys work on everything. I've been to your garage, and you have a great garage. Yeah. Uh, but Miatas, you guys love those cars, and you race them. And uh, we just want to learn more about what you're doing, why Miatas, and how much fun you guys are having working on those things. Yeah. You want me to take this one? Yeah. Okay. Sure. So, um, <laughs> yeah, the the Miata is just such a good car. And, and that's a very blanketed sort of statement. It's I think it's honestly one of the best cars that's ever come out. And I know that that, again, is, is a very blanketed statement. But I think that um, it just fits so many different walks of life. Uh, we deal with customers who are, you know, first car, last car, weekend car, race yeah. car, track car, you know, anything in between. And then, um, you know, just the excitement that people get with those cars. And you're talking about all generations. I mean, generations. the Miata, I, I, I have friends that have had all these different year Miatas. I have not heard one bad word about the Miatas. Hmm. I think that the bad words that are out there about those cars are from people that just don't have the experience with them or yeah. haven't had an experience with them. And it's not even having a positive experience. It's just having an experience with them because every single person that we've met that's driven one of those cars nothing but good things to say yeah, there's so much mm -hmm. fun and yeah. and the people that have you know the negative things to say you know it, it's oh the car's too small oh the car's this the car's too slow and, but if you ask them if they've ever driven it 100 percent of the time they'll say no wow well, well the numbers kind of speak for themselves don't they i mean they, they, they've sold how many millions of i mean they've sold a ton of those cars oh, yeah. for how many years it's been around for what 30 so years this year is the 35th anniversary wow oh really <laughs> yeah this year's the 35th so anniversary. those cl they classify or can be Classified as a classic, yeah, basically yeah, yeah. Yeah. according to Frank yeah. Jesus. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we've we've had debate on that in our socials, haven't we? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, oh yeah. But yeah. you can get the the California historic plates on them here. Oh really? Yeah. Oh, so okay. it's, so that's twenty five years. So do you still have to smog it with that? Yep. So Damn yeah, no, you do. No. Uh, there's something that may change at some point, but mm. right now you do still have to smog with the historic plates. Mm. Um, I'm hoping that'll change, but you know, yeah, California. If I don't have to smuggle a Miata, I'll buy one. <laughs> and you guys can fit me in, fit me in one. That's fair. So I don't look like a circus bear. That's right. Right. Cut out the whole floor and just <laughs> <laughs> drop you right in there. Yeah. 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 I, was, I was actually one of those guys that trash talked the Miata until my friend put me in one. Fair. Well, you know, shoehorned me into one because it was the older one. And um, got to drive it for a little bit until my knees, I got tired of hitting the dashboard. But um, I thought it was a great car. And at the track, those things, I mean fly bone stock ones mm -hmm. they don't have a ton of power um and guys just smile throwing them ear around. to ear yeah. oh yeah oh yeah so i've never heard anybody in my lifetime uh talk negatively about a miata mm -hmm. um if they've been in one sure so i, I agree with that statement 100 yeah. percent. yeah and he's saying stock you can take it on the track and have fun but you guys have been doing some fun modifications to them yeah. so when somebody comes to you well, I should ask, do people come to you and say, hey, here's my Miata. Can you jazz this thing up a little bit? Because I want to go have more fun with it. Is that what happens? So that's that's one customer. There's some people that just get the car because they hear all the good things about it but don't know all the aftermarket support that exists for that car. So they're, they say, oh, this is cool, but can we make it faster? Can we make it better? Can we do this? And um, we just hit them with the catalog and say, hey, you know, how far do you want to go? You know, sky's yeah. the limit. It's it's one of those cars that just has such a good support system for in, in the aftermarket to really take the car wherever you want it. And the only thing that's going to limit you is really your budget, mm -hmm. because you can do turbo swap, uh, or you can put a turbo in it on turbo swap, put a turbo in it, you can put a supercharger in it, you can put a V8 in it, you can put K series in it. What kind of high horsepower for each one of these? I mean, how? How does the horsepower change on a, on a Miata when you start adding you know, turbo and supercharge and all that? Um, it varies. I mean, the the more mild turbo kits are going to get you at like 200 horsepower. 
Uh, maybe a little less than that for like the carb compliant ones, but roughly about 200 horsepower. Well, that'll get you moving on a little car like that. With a car that weighs yeah. pretty much nothing. Yeah, you but just... they come stock with what, 140? Uh, mm-hmm. So depending on if we're talking like the, the early ones, uh, I believe they were like 131. Well, somewhere in that. Might be okay. a little less than that. 128? Well, mm. less than that. Oh, okay. Like 116? Maybe like 100. Okay, man. Oh, man. So, so we know he's never driven a stock one. He's like he's always out there on the well, ones that are all I, jazzed up a bit. It feels like you're driving 130. Yeah. Oh, you got yeah, 130 yeah. Uh, horsepower in it. Sure, so. it's a it's a go kart with doors. It's it's a street oh, legal go kart with doors. <laughs> and yeah, that's that's how you feel when you when you drive one of those. Wow. Now, do you both race them? Uh, I do, but not in the same way that Ryan does. So I do autocross. Okay, and uh, uh, it's. It's uh, sort of my jam right now, and, and that's what I enjoy mm-hmm. doing. Uh, it gives me sort of uh, the ability to be able to go back and look at what my time is, what do I need to do to change, you know, checking certain things, higher pressures and stuff like that. Um, you know, as opposed to being out on the track, you know, you set it up once, you're, you're gone, you know, road racing, uh, and you don't have the opportunity to make adjustments until you actually come back in, and that could be some time. So mm-hmm. uh, I like fiddling. Oh, nice, nice. Do yeah. you run in the uh, stock class? Which class do you run in, or do you just kind of time trial for yourself? Yeah, it's, it's more or less time trials. Mm-hmm. So oh, cool. okay. we use the autocross as a, a testing ground for our workhorse car. Yep. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. we have a fleet of Miatas, unfortunately. And I think I think with most <laughs> most Miata owners, they usually have more than one. It's one of those things. I I don't know why that is, but if you talk to people that have owned that car for more than a few years, they probably have more than one. Doesn't mean both of them run. <laughs> it's they, like a rotary they, owner. They probably. It's like, it's like, hey, I was like, it's like uh, I, I could save it. I could save this one. This yeah. is going to be the one that I'm going to save. And, and it never happens. Oh, that's it never funny. happens. But um, yeah, with the autocross, we really use it as our, our um, testing grounds for our, our workhorse mm-hmm. car that we, is our R&D car that we go and we just really try to beat the heck out of and try to get it to do something different, but it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't die. Mm. And, and, and again, imagine, that's, I'm oh, sorry. I was going to say, I imagine you do that because one, it's fun, but two, then you can turn around to the customer and say, okay, this is how this works. This is yeah. what it's going to feel like. This is what it's going to do to the car. Yeah. yeah. Right? yeah. We, yeah. we do a lot of testing. The reason why we use the autocross for that is mostly because of the vicinity. It's just very close to us. It's in San Maria. Okay. So it just winds up being close and it's, it's a half day or a whole day as opposed to being like a whole weekend where we have to dedicate and you know, going to Button Willow or Will Springs or something like that where we have to okay. spend, you know, Friday to Sunday night. And then come back and then work, you know, Monday through Friday, and there's no there's no rest in between. Um, with the with the autocross, uh, because it's in Santa Maria, uh, it just winds up being uh, really close and uh, just re- a real easy a day on us because we can drive up there and do what we need to do, do our testing, and then come back and hopefully catch a couple winks of sleep. Yeah, and that also when we do the testing, it also kind of goes back to getting the Miata. Two things that it it uh, provides us with is durability and reliability. That's what you see on the track with that. You can beat the crap out of that car, and it continues to come back. Wow. And as long as you do the maintenance on it, um, you know, it, it will stand up and, and, and be there for the next race. You know, quality as far as, you know, how the car was built, it's there. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's something that uh, when you start understanding why this car is so cool, that's one of the pieces you start picking up. And then when you get behind the wheel, you start driving it. You go into the turns <laughs> without having to lift. You're, you know, wow. going like 40, 50 miles an hour into the turn. Boom. You know, just zoom, zoom. Wow. Mm-hmm. Just, uh, That's fun. Nice really plug cool. for me out of, yeah, or for it, Mazda, yeah, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> oh, zoom, zoom. Yeah. yeah. Zoom, zoom. Well, I'm That's curious. Trendy. So at one point, at one point, was it a subtle transition where you guys all of a sudden said, you know, I how come we're all of a sudden working on all these Miatas or did you actually make a conscious decision to say, these cars are cool. Let's work on them. Let's, let's put them together. Let's race them. <laughs> but how did that all come about? So uh, we started out with the idea of doing sort of the muscle cars and Japanese cars. And when I say Japanese cars, it was pretty broad. Uh, we kind of focused on uh, the Z cars uh, we focused on the Evo. We did a, a, a sort of remake of uh, a car. That, I saw that one. That was beautiful. Yeah. The blue one. Was it the blue one? Yeah. No. Yeah. Beautiful. And, and that eventually uh, got picked up uh, in some of the advertising that they did on Fast and Furious. Yeah. Uh, we were actually Ooh. out on the scene, on the uh, uh, filming scene, uh, when they did uh, the filming out at Button Willow. 
And it was actually pretty cool. And uh, so we, we, we took that car and we wanted to see what aftermarket parts could we put on it that would generate a tremendous amount of horsepower. And we, you know, swapped in some parts, swapped in other parts, tested it, uh, came up with some other um, parts that we added to it. And we got some pretty decent horsepower. I think we were probably somewhere in the area of maybe 450. Uh, and that was naturally aspirated. Uh, I'm sorry. I lied about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it was boosted. So, uh, and, and that was for a car that we were able to get smogged. Uh, we we had uh, somewhere in the area of I think about uh, four or four fifty somewhere. Yeah, something that's like that. yeah. the plan for that one was really to see how far we could push the stock frame turbo and stock injectors, just to see how far it could really go and and running at almost a hundred percent duty cycle wow. and and just to see how far you know the Evo Ten platform could could go. Yeah, and uh, that was kind of where we ended up. And then we came up with okay, so how can we make it aesthetically cooler? Yeah. And we uh, put on a uh, a Voltex? Uh, yeah, a Voltex. Voltex. We had a Voltex wing. We reached out to uh, Varus Japan. Uh, they sent us at the time uh, one of their new kits uh, that was one of, I think, three that was available at the time. Two of them were on their display car, so we had one of them. And then uh, we had some stuff from Charge Speed uh, USA. Mm. I remember you guys had a great write-up yeah. on yeah. that uh, Fast and Furious car. Yeah. 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 And you and had was, a lot of attention for that. Yeah, it, that was that was cool. Yeah, and it, and it was sort of a, a, a thing where I think we were like right, we, uh, like if, if you were in a race and you had uh, uh, the Fast and Furious and then us, uh, we were kind of a little bit ahead of what they were trying to create at the time. I believe we were. Um, you know, maybe other people might say otherwise, but I think, you know, in featuring our car, at least putting it out there during the advertising, it was sort of a nod to what, what they were doing. Nice. So yeah, that's, it fun. was cool. What it a was, fun project. Yeah. It was cool. And we got to meet a lot of yeah. people there. Uh, he got some pictures with, uh, uh, one of the, uh, yeah, uh, we snuck in with the, with the, um, the cast and they thought we worked there and <laughs> they were asking us, I was like, Hey, can you move that Audi R8 or Hey, can you go over there? I'm like, Hey man, I don't work here. <laughs> uh, you got the wrong guy. I might look like these guys, but you know, I'm just here to just kind of blend in. Yeah. And they, I built that car over there. Yeah, yeah. I'm just making sure that you guys don't mess with, with, uh, with my car. Did, did the uh, yeah. movie boost your guys' business at all? Or just kind of, did it really, I mean, obviously advertising for the Evo was, helpful because mm -hmm. you guys were building that car but did the movie itself or that franchise really help boost you guys because it sounds like you don't have those type of fast and furious wannabe yeah guys coming to your shop you have more serious people average uh, joes just wanting maintenance and then some tracks type stuff which is not fast and furious <laughs> guys so do you think that helped or didn't matter for you guys uh i don't i don't know that it necessarily helped it was something cool that we got to experience mm. i would i would definitely say that um, but as far as like our, our race customers and stuff like that, it was it's just something that we could say that we did, but yeah. as, uh, and something we could use for you know. Uh, it's on the resume. It's, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's on the resume. resume. It's, it's part of our, our uh, extended experience. Yeah, we can say that we were a part of, but I, I don't know that uh, it it really uh, pushed us, or you know, we could say we were, we were a Fast and Furious person, or yeah, you know. well, because you know, there's a lot of people that you might know personally as well i know plenty of people that find that the <laughs> fast and furious franchise is the genesis of changing everything in the jdm or import motorsports which i don't believe that i mean i guess it did change a lot of stuff but for me i could i could care less about the fast and furious it was already there i mean you know, i was yeah. racing way yeah, before that I was exactly racing way before that and when fast and furious came it just got more mainstream you know and yeah. then negatively or positively you take it however you will but um i feel like people um kind of when they use that as a benchmark or as a milestone is not it's not always the greatest in the greatest light especially coming from the muscle car guys like all my you know hot rod buddies they just look at every import as everything is fast and furious which is obviously not the case mm -hmm. right but it did give this kind of connotation <laughs> that you know you put stickers and like dan likes to say the, the fart can um <laughs> on the hondas and stuff like that but um yeah it's just it's just curious to me if it changed because i know it changed a lot of business for um, people that had sell body kits and wheels and stuff like that, because that movie brought a lot of products to market. Mm -hmm. um, but in your case, that wasn't. Yeah, I don't. I don't think we we were looking for it. I don't think we we were out there uh, looking for a bump or anything like that. I think that there was more an internal uh, sort of uh, push to where we wanted to be, mm -hmm. and it kind of was. Yeah, uh, 
you know, continuing down that racing scene, continuing down, you know, providing performance uh, in, in some ways. And, and it's not to take anything away from uh, Fast and Furious. It was more about street racing. And, and we we wanted to be more responsible as far as uh, what we built and making it sh making sure that it was purpose built for either the track or for the street and that uh, the folks that were part of what we were trying to create were also responsible enough to, yeah. to understand the difference. Yeah. So how did that car end up lead to the Miata? So, so obviously there was some kind of transformation here. You guys were kind of evolving through this process. Ended up with the Miatas. Um, I when think... did you buy your first one? <laughs> Uh, and I think that's probably where, where it started when he first bought, because when I say his first one, he's probably owned 20, wow. 25. Wow. Well, I'm in the thirties. Thirties. <laughs> okay. Wow. So Wait, I don't feel so bad now. <laughs> All right. I've, I've never owned a Miata. I own two of them now. Oh, wow. And I still have my, my muscle cars. Sure. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I enjoy driving the Miata just because of what I've learned from, you know, being behind the wheel, working on the car. It's fantastic well yeah. my my question is with the the quantity now like you you have two you've owned 20 is or that 30 or 30 or, 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 yeah. or yeah 30 yeah. It's, it's, um yeah. is that because I, I know you're talking about durability reliability and that number kind of does that equate to it you know uh one not performing at its best or falling apart or is it just the affordability of the car and what you could do with it so you want to kind of you could afford to have 20 of them and fix them up you know um bespoke to how you want it and and have a whole fleet of them to uh, enjoy i don't know that it's it's either one of those things i think personally for me it's more i have car add <laughs> and that, like I, I'll, I'll get one and i'm like okay this is the way i want it okay and then so either somebody will come up and say hey uh is that for sale and you know anything's for sale um, everything's yeah. for sale right? yeah everything's for sale <laughs> you go buy and, another one and, just, and make it even better yeah right? and yeah. then do something else for me too um a lot of it uh once we had kind of got into how deep we are with the miata stuff yeah in in nerding out about um packages and colors and and rarity and and all that kind of stuff then you start to really look at you know the value of the car and then figure out oh okay well this jumped up overnight oh wow or or this one is is the is this rare or um you know changing them out for for yeah. different models it just it just made sense Hmm. Um, you know, you'd get one or I'd, I'd get one and then I'd drive it for a little bit of time and somebody would say, Hey, is that for sale? And, you know, like I said, everything's for sale. Yeah. As <laughs> long as you can pay the price. Well, yeah. for sale, and, right? and you yeah. guys touch upon like the support that you had with aftermarket scene. <clears throat> How has Mazda been uh, influential, um, with that community as a whole? Have they, you know, kind of maybe did like driver clinics for the Miata as they designed the new chassis right now? Like, have you seen that influx of, of support from Mazda corporate? So. Uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, I don't know that, that I've seen them do driver clinics, but they do a lot of, uh, they do get involved with sponsoring events, which okay. is great. Um, there's an event that we uh, were a part of and that we, we go to every year that's, um, uh, it used to be at Laguna Seca and uh, it went on tour during COVID and then came back to uh, Sonoma last year. Mm. And then this year it's at Sonoma and Mazda is one of the, the sponsors of, of the event. Um, which is cool to see, you know, a big corporate company like them uh, be involved and, and they get involved with some smaller groups and stuff like that. So um, that's one part of it. Um, on the racing side, there's the Mazda Motorsports program. Oh, and with the Mazda Motorsports program, you can basically um, reach out to Mazda directly with parts requests or stuff that you need. And it's not expensive yeah, totally agree yeah, the same with the, cool. in the rotary community they're well, they very, act, very active it went, in uh, one of our previous shows with jeffrey willard he talked about how you know nissan is not yeah. a part of that community as much as they'd like to have them um and they're dropping the ball and they're you, dropping the yeah, ball we're talking about because that. it's affecting yeah. the enthusiasm Sale. that the owners would like to see them yeah. have because right. it does spur on you know mm -hmm. those like, how many mazda guys Miata guys that are Mazda guys because Mazda got behind them. Then you say, "Oh, Mazda's at this event! Like, wow, that's really cool." Yeah, sponsoring it, and, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I think it makes a huge impact on yeah. the user experience um, with that particular platform. Yeah, right. yeah. You know, and and because you're so concentrated on that specific chassis, are you kind of like one of the few 
um, shops that really concentrate on Miatas because I, I haven't um, heard of another shop that was like, you know, strictly, you know, hopping up um, um, Miatas from the ground up. There there are definitely some that are out there that oh, okay. focus on there. They will develop parts around that car, you know, through, through the four generations of the car. Um, that that's all that they do. They only make Miata parts. They only want to sell Miata parts. They only want to do that stuff. And there are certain companies that only retail Miata parts. And then there are certain companies that only manufacture Miata parts. Oh, okay. um, some of those companies maybe branch out where they have other applications just because they put the R&D and maybe figure out that the parts work on other vehicles. Um, uh, there are some shops. There's a lot of shops in Japan that are very focused on the Roadster MX-5. Um, and that's all that they do. They yeah. restore them, they race them, they build them, they sell them. Is the majority of your clientele uh, Miatas, or no, what would you say the percentage is? Uh, uh, I would I would say it's probably probably about 50-50. Okay. 60-40. Um, okay, 60-40. <laughs> 60 Miata. 40. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's that's pretty big. Else. Yeah. So, pretty big. Well, when I've been to your shop, I've seen Corvettes and some beautiful muscle cars. You guys work on everything. And oh, I've yeah. seen them stripped down pretty far yeah. before. It's like, wow, these guys are going to put this oh, thing yeah. back together again. Well, I'm, I'm interested to know, like, your background, knowing that you work on American and Japanese. What is your guys' individual backgrounds in the motor industry? Are you engineers, um, tuners? I mean, like, yeah, how in depth are you guys on that? So, uh, I started off. Uh, after I graduated, graduated high school, I went to a, a technical school for automotive, uh, repair. And, uh, I worked after I uh, graduated, I worked at a body shop. Um, and it was kind of interesting as far as uh, what we we're doing. It was a Chevrolet dealership. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, shortly after that, uh, I had with my wife, uh, we had opened a, a shop in, uh, in the town that we lived in and it was all customizing oh, okay. and it was aftermarket customizing and uh we were doing some stuff with hearst at the time and uh that kind of was maybe the first entry into what car what what the potential of car customizing was all about but again it, it was it's different it was different back then than what it mm. is today uh to, to were you into customizing before you got into the automotive field like were you into customizing your own car before you got into the trades or uh you know th that's hard to say because um and and, uh, and i'm explain it's hard to say because you know as a high schooler Back then, you were making like a buck twenty-five an hour. <laughs> you didn't have a lot of capital to, to no. customize your car. Yeah. There were parts out there, and and uh, when I was in high school, I took the automotive classes and and trying to figure out how to drop a cam in correctly, so that you know you could fire it up and you didn't have to you know pull it back out or do some do some other stuff because you had the timing wrong or or, or whatever the case may be. Uh, I did what I could with what I had. Um, as a, you know, young guy, but uh, as we started our business and we got connected with some of the, the vendors that we were working with, you know, our capital also increased and we kind of, uh, carved out a niche, uh, that was, uh, more on the side of customizing. Mm -hmm. We used to display at the McCormick, uh, place. Uh, so they're, they're similar to like, uh, um, the LA, uh, auto convention oh, nice. and, and that sort of stuff. So we'd show all of our stuff there. We'd, uh, work with some of the car dealers that we were working with that we would customize a car and, and have it as a display car there. So it was, it was kind of interesting. So that, that's kind of where I started. But at some point down the road, I also sort of changed up the career path that I, I went into and it was a little bit different. Uh, you know, like 20, 30 years later, uh, you know, I was in that same situation where I worked in corporate America, uh, decided, you know, uh, there was an opportunity to be able to, to walk away with a, enough uh, money in my pocket from working and retirement, stuff like that. This guy was doing really well. He had started uh, getting recognized in, in different uh, media magazines and stuff like uh, stuff that was current, more current at the time. And he had started out with Hondas and then slowly you know, started moving the, the Evo and everything. And um, he and I started talking and we were like, uh, maybe we should start a business. And, you know, again, I still always had muscle cars. Uh, at the time I, I, I had a Corvette, a uh, 58 Corvette and was tinkering with that, doing stuff with that. And uh, as we started talking, we were, we were like, well, you know, this would be kind of interesting because when I had my car, I realized 
if I needed work done on it, there was no one in town to work on the car. <clears throat> mm. And I, I thought, well, you know, this might be an opportunity. And when we started talking, I started looking at some of the stuff that he was doing. I was like, I'll bet that's the same case for his his market, what he was involved in with the mm. Japanese cars. And boom, the light bulb went off. And then we started working together and he was showing me some of the stuff that he was doing. I was kind of showing him some of the stuff we were doing and boom, the business took wow. off. And I love it. This That's is a father's awesome. son. Yeah. Now, I don't want to, I don't want to read too much into this, but R and R, Ralph and Ryan, correct? Rest and relaxation. Okay. That's <laughs> all we do. <laughs> if you come no, in and we're taking car, I've never, there's no rest and relaxation. No, no. We're working on cars. I've never we asked that, that question before. <clears throat> I've known you guys for years and I've never asked that question before. R and R? Yeah. It's Ralph, it's and, Ralph Ryan. and Ryan. Okay, good. Okay. Nothing good. gets by we, you, CJ. No, we've solved that problem. <laughs> and, okay, it, and it's not necessarily Ralph and Ryan. It <laughs> could be Ryan, Ryan and, and Ralph. Ralph. Okay. Good. Yeah, just depending on depending on if you ask me or if you ask him. So I find this a very common kind of story. Dad's in the hot rods, oh. son's into the imports. You grew up, obviously your dad had these cars since you were, you know, before you were born. Sure. Um, you never had an interest in getting to the hot rods or what? Because I started the same way too with Hondas. Hondas like the gateway car, mm -hmm. right? You start yeah. with the Hondas and then it goes, I, was, yeah. I don't know, because maybe the barrier to market's, you know, very yeah. light. But um, you would had no interest in the hot rods before? What made you want to get into the imports versus the what your dad was doing? I don't have a good answer for that. Uh, <laughs> no, no, that's that's not true. Ask him about his '69 Camaro. Oh, okay, so uh, <laughs> well, there's a good story here. I, no, I so can feel I, it. I take that back. So uh, <laughs> when I was younger, yeah, I just, I just never, I never was really, really interested in in the muscle car stuff. I thought it was cool, but I just, hmm. I don't know. It, it, I felt like it just didn't apply to me, hmm. or it just didn't, you didn't connect. Uh, yeah, exactly. It didn't yeah. didn't connect with me. Um, it doesn't mean that I didn't think they were cool. I definitely respected them. Definitely, you know, give the guy a thumbs up if I'd see him driving down the street, that sort of thing. But um, I don't know. It just it just didn't didn't really connect with me. And he tried. He tried. He we <laughs> uh, before I could drive, uh, we had a Fox Body project uh, that we were oh, Mustang. trying to yeah, yeah, yeah trying body. to trying to get that together, um, and I pushed against. Uh, we it never it never really came to fruition because I just you know, it was like really? no, I'm going this way just going over here mm -hmm. um so yeah i, I just it, it, they're cool but yeah i just never well, I, I see a great opportunity with that question that you just asked being that you guys are in business together father and son i think you guys need to do individual build jdm and american muscle and well, sounds like they already have that well no and compete <laughs> and compete and seek oh. is, is there a little friendly competition within you know, the workspace with your dad like when you're coming to building or it's more of like teaching each other you know kind of uh, uh probably techniques. A little both. yeah probably See, a little i like both. that yeah, <laughs> probably yeah. a little both i, I always try to f finish faster than he does <laughs> <laughs> there there's a lot of collaboration on the bills we do whether it's uh, japanese uh or whether it's american and i always I always believe that, um, you know, an old dog can learn new tricks. Yeah. And when I see some of the stuff that he's doing, I'm interested. The The thing that's kind of uh, interesting about this, the, the relationship that we have, he was describing, he wasn't interested in uh, muscle cars. That was the same way I felt about the cars that he was working on. Mm -hmm. You know, back when we, uh, when I had my shop uh, in Illinois, we had uh, Hondas coming in, we had Toyotas coming in, Mazdas coming in, and we were working on those. Uh, but they weren't like the cool stuff back then. At least I didn't see them that way. Mm -hmm. I was still, you know, into uh, the muscle car stuff, but that's what was paying the bills. And when, you know, he and I started talking, I started seeing how he's modifying the cars and I looked into sort of the, the uh, stance on them and, and kind of the way they sounded and everything. I thought, you know, there, there's got to be something. This has got to be that same sort of thing that happened in the 60s with the muscle cars. Yeah, you could buy a Roadrunner and keep it all stock, but also you could juice it up. And that's what, what he was doing uh, back then where I was like, oh, okay. You know, I'm not an old old dog that I can't learn something new, and that's kind of what I picked up. That's from. cool. That's so, very cool. Yeah. That's very cool. And I love that it seems that you guys work together really well. We do. Yeah, yeah it's cool. you can just feel the energy that you guys do a good job. Brian smiling, collaborating. Though. Brian's like, oh, you should have been here <laughs> when we like drove over. He wants to add to that. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. <laughs> so it didn't. It did not start in the beginning that way. And you know, here I'm coming from a corporate environment 
where uh, the hierarchy, the way it was set up and how I understood it is, you know, okay, so I'm the manager, I'm the uh, GM, whatever. I've got to be able to uh, uh, put the wheels in motion as far as what we're doing. And I have to make sure that those things get done. And there was, you know, there was that sort of conflict between, I guess, how I communicated versus, you know, how he took it. And what I didn't understand, and it took me a while to, to sort of get this, was that he and I were on the same playing field. He and I were trying to achieve the same goal. And it wasn't going to happen by me alone. It had to happen as a collective group. That's and awesome. once I took that, that attitude, once I understood where uh, the opportunities were in us being able to work together, then my mind sort of opened up to understand what he was doing and then realized, wow, this is sort of the future, uh, and, uh, a future of, of where we're going. And I, and I say that because the introduction of, of the Japanese cars was sort of the introduction for me to understand the computer side of how a car operates. I understood from the old school side, you know, you have your coil, you have your plugs, you didn't have a, a, a computer connected to the car. You had to figure out how to tune it and get it correctly. And your screwdriver was the tuner. Yeah. yeah. Right? For the, carbs. <laughs> the carburetor. Mm -hmm. But yeah. when I worked in corporate America, I, I learned programming and, and the, the idea of being able to incorporate, you know, tweaking the computer and making it uh, work better so that it understood how the... And, and my knowledge for uh, my knowledge previous about uh, how you manually did it kind of sunk up. So it, it was like one of those things where when we started working together, it was like, ah, yeah, I understand that. And then when he would explain certain things to me, it was like, I get it now. I get it now. Nice. So it was, it, it, it took some time. Uh, there were, uh, I'd say, you know, probably a, a year or two where, you know, we were bumping heads. <laughs> sure. But. Learning process. Uh, we got there. Yeah. You guys are going through the yeah, learning process. We got there. Well, I think Ralph, you get a lot of credit for um, you know, coming around on a on a little, you know, two thousand pound hundred horsepower car, being able to appreciate that coming from the V eight world and the Roadrunner world and so on, because that's two different worlds for sure. But I totally get where you're coming from, whereas the Miata is it's an iconic car. Mm -hmm. I mean, for sure. I, I remember when they first came out, my brother-in-law got one. I was really disappointed. I was hyped on that car. He let me take it out for a spin and so on. I literally could not fit in the car. <laughs> I, I know you were saying that. You were saying like, oh, yeah. some guys can't fit. I literally, it was like, because I, I, I had a pickup truck back in the day, one of those little Mitsubishis, and mm -hmm. same thing. It was, you know, a single cab. I'm six foot one, and I always just felt like, God, I got to have my legs bent. Like, like hey, yeah. my knees have to be up here to be able to drive the thing. And I was massively disappointed. Like, I want to drive a Miata, man. Miata <laughs> looks super fun, but yeah. I can't, I literally can't fit in it. So, you know, I, I think you got points, Ralph, for coming around to that that mindset of like, they're both cool in their own way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, yeah. to go from uh, any muscle car to an import is one thing, but to go from a muscle car to a Miata, like, like the Miata is like the smallest import. Opposite uh, end of the really world. Really, yeah. one of the smallest imports you could go to. And the platform, of I don't know of any American car that even fits that same type of platform. Maybe there is, but not that I know of right now, like that has that mm -hmm. kind of small displacement, small size, compact design, you know, nimble mm -hmm. kind of thing. It's like, like, like Dan was saying, literally opposite ends of the spectrum. So to combine the two is just like, wow, that's kind of interesting. It's like you have a Roadrunner and a Miata. Like, mm -hmm. what? You have what? You know, <laughs> yeah. it'd be one thing if you said you had like, I don't know, uh, a Supra or exactly. yeah. even, oh, yeah. even exactly. an Evo, which has, you know, a, quite a bit of horsepower stock, you know, compared to other cars. But no, it's a Miata. It's <laughs> completely different. But yeah, and, you know, you you race it, you, you drive it for what it was made for. Mm -hmm. So I think that's kind of really cool perspective that you can offer. But it sounds to me that you're also... A little bit more open-minded, just in general, of like learning. It seems like you're constantly learning, which might be a, you know, uh, yeah, that's that's absolutely, factor. absolutely true. Uh, when when I first started getting into Miatas, I started sort of uh, connecting some of the things that I started seeing from what Mazda did and how it actually connected back to what I saw what was going on back in the '60s. For one the color combinations that they came out with was so cool on the, on the Miatas. Mm -hmm. And you trace that back to 
what they were doing on on the you know '69 uh, Mustangs, the Camaros, the Dodge, the, the, the Dodge Mopar, stuff, yeah, yeah. yeah, the Mopar stuff, yeah. and then the little tweaks that Mazda was doing with the M M series uh, or M M editions, uh, and then some of the off sort of uh, cars that they didn't really. I don't know if they didn't uh, come out with saying it's a, it's a special edition, but it was a limited production of them. And the same thing they, they did back in uh, the 60s and 70s with, you know, the GM cars, the Ford cars, the Mopars. And so I started looking at that and seeing, you know, the connection back and forth. And again, as I started looking at the two, what we do here in, the, in America as a car culture and what Japan, we are like really synced up. And we take tidbits of what they're doing right now in uh, uh, with their car culture, and we take it and we tweak it to to make it uh, what we would like to see it. Um, right now, uh, with the uh, Fast and Furious stuff, it really turned into more aesthetics, so mm. making your car look fast. Because here in here in California and a lot of other states, you you've got to deal with the uh, uh, emissions. So there were people that you know kind of crossed that line adjusted their cars, and then they had to deal with it. There were other people that didn't go down that road, but they still made it kind of like look cool, look, look fast. Um, you know, this, the 60s, And sound fast. Yeah, and, and, and sound, sound fast. Sound yeah. fast mostly. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Sound fast mostly. In, in, the, in the 60s, uh, it wasn't about that. It was about having a fast car. Now mm. you, you look in Japan, uh, they like those cars that were in the uh, 60s and 70s, especially those quarter mile cars with the paint jobs on them. Mm -hmm. You see it all over a lot yeah. of the groups that are there. And why? We uh, we thought it was cool back then. They think it's cool. And they're taking bit, bits and pieces. They take, we take, and we come up with this really cool culture of cars. Yeah, yeah. that's awesome. That's cool. I love that perspective. It's a... Uh... It's uh, refreshing yeah. to see, you know, the combining because, you know, I feel like there's such a division just in not just with the world today, but like within in cars, you know, the import guys only deal with imports and the muscle cars. But now we're starting to see more and more as we talk to more people that there is more of like a kind of like a crossing over because let's just face it. Rotting is rotting, right? Mm -hmm. You fix up a car, doesn't matter if it's import or domestic rotting is rotting right so i feel like that's maybe kind of like the uh segue the the yeah the transition for people to kind of i don't find this with people that keep their car stock i feel this more with people that are into modifications yeah. or customize i should say you custom I, I, wish, I wish more people were felt that way or had that that mindset because i think when a lot of people uh go to like cars and coffee events or go to you know those, those meetings mm -hmm. and stuff like that if they show up in the wrong car it's going to upset somebody and they're going to come and they're either going to say something about it or, or they're going to have some sort of problem with why that car is there. Like, what, you know, what's this Miata doing here? This is a Corvette meet. Mm -hmm. This is a muscle car meet. You know, what are you doing here? And they have the same mindset. You know, what, that rotting is rotting. And, and they have the same passion and the same everything. It's just a different car. Yeah. Different person, different car, different yeah. lights. Well, I think that's where like, Cars and Coffee is a great thing because it's kind of leveling the playing field. It's not a car show. It's like we're just meeting and talking about cars. It's cars in general, mm -hmm. right? Because um, I've been to meets. That's why I don't really like going to certain car shows because uh, – or car shows in general because if it's specifically for hot rods only, it's like, well, you know, what if I have an old – like Frank DeJesus, he's got an yeah. old classic Toyota. It qualifies – by their standards, it qualifies as a classic, but they don't look at it that way because it's the import. So there's kind of like this prejudice just because it's not one of them, sure. right? Which is terrible. I think that's a terrible thing. And, it, and where the Cars and Coffee allows for people to do stuff like that. Because there's plenty of car, like as far as modifications go, that I think are terrible. Like the cambered out, you know, broken broken car, <laughs> basically. You know, <laughs> if you guys aren't familiar with that, it's where the cars look like the wheels are Kid yeah, all the way the broken. Axle broke. Yeah. yeah, and yeah. but you know what? Hey, at the end of the day, I have to realize that's a thing. That's their choice. That's sure. their way of personalizing their car. Whether I think it's terrible or not, it's not about that. It's like you did something in your car. Hey, you qualify. You should ask these guys if they do that before you start. Have you ever had a customer want to like, no. do like <laughs> negative forty degree camera? No. Yeah, I mean, I, we we've had people come in with those cars, and I I kind of have the same. You know, hey, <laughs> let, let me talk to you over here for a second. Let, let, me, <laughs> let, me, let me tell you why this is wrong. And, and, but I try to do it in a gentle way. Yeah. So it's just like you know, this is cool, but you know, you're also putting yourself at risk potentially. Yeah. And it, it's something that we don't necessarily get involved with because of the risk factor oh, of, oh, yeah. of that whole thing. Um. But we definitely see cars like that. And it's cool. It's cool seeing it go down the road. It's cool seeing it, you know, an inch off the ground or less. Mm -hmm. 
But there's also a pretty big danger factor to that if that's your yeah. regular and they everyday sometimes car. they find out the hard way, you know, whatever. Yeah. And, and Oil pans yeah. and, and frame damage. <laughs> and, or the whole and, wheel comes off, yeah. you know. So, yeah. you know, hey, but hey, if, you, if you're into that kind of thing, knock yourself out. It's your car. You do whatever you want. Yeah. I'm just happy that people are actually into their cars. Yeah. At least I think they're into their cars. Yeah. Um, and that's what I feel like yeah. that matters. But going back to um, your guys' shop, um, when did you guys start working together? Uh, 2003. 2003. And... Uh, my, my, sorry. 2013. 13. <laughs> and did you... And were you at, in working in corporate before you guys started the shop, or were you, did you have your own shop doing the muscle car stuff? Uh, no. Uh, I was still sort of transitioning uh, from corporate America to uh, opening the shop. Okay. Uh, because of the industry that I, I, I worked in, um, I would have had to... Uh, gets sort of certain approval about having a second business uh, or, or operating a, in, a, in a secondary business. But I knew that kind of things were winding down and it was more or less. We, officially, we didn't uh, start doing business until two, two, 2014 when I was completely severed from uh, corporate America. Got mm -hmm. it. Cool. Can we ask, I mean, can you disclose what aspect or what part of corporate America? You FBI. Oh. No, no, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. CIA. The way, the way you asked him was like you totally opened the door for him to do that. So no, no, I, I work in the financial services industry. Oh, nice. And uh, there's certain protocols. Oh, okay. uh, and because um, we're, we're fingerprinted in that oh, industry, got it. and uh, just the way it operates, uh, uh, there there could be opportunity for. Mm, Illegal activity. Oh, God. Mm. But, so but, they, but now that you're fixing Miatas, your fingerprints are all over the valve cover. You know, so. <laughs> yeah, That's right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, could, I could never get into, you know, chop shopping or any of that stuff because I get be caught in a second. You'd be busted. <laughs> so you're not a secret agent is what no, you're telling no, us. No. Okay. All right. I all right. like to think he, I have that time when, <laughs> when I'm driving my Miata. <laughs> That's an undercover vehicle, Miata. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you just blend in. Nobody sees you. You're way down here. So what's your uh, guys' favorite type of uh, thing to do for the Miatas is like, well, you know, when you have a customer come in, what's what do you guys prefer? I mean, I'm sure you'd like to do everything, but what's kind of your favorite ideal type of uh, mod or prep or setup? It, it's kind of hard to say. Uh, I would say suspension, mm -hmm. definitely. Um, but it kind of depends on what, what the customer wants. I mean, what, what their purpose is for the car. Mm -hmm. um, if they're, you know, they bought it as their daily driver, you know, we're not going to put a, a 10 point cage in their car. Yeah. It just doesn't make sense. Yeah. 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 We um, usually try, I've to, seen that, try to ask yeah. them, <laughs> ask them up front, what is the purpose of the vehicle? And then from that, then we can kind of build out and, you know, make suggestions as far as what kind of improvements okay. we can well, do. It's like a mental decision tree that I have, you know, what's the purpose of this car? Okay, are you going to use it for racing? Or are you not going to use it for racing? Is it for this? Is it for that? And then kind of figure out from there to sort of whittle it down to figure out, okay, this is this is the avenue that you should start on if this is the goal for the car. Yeah, okay. We, we well, find a lot of times uh, that idea of autocrossing is usually somewhere in their uh, thought of, you know, how they plan to use the car. It may not be, you know, a, a car that they're going to use for autocross every single month, but, you know, uh, it's gotten really popular, and yep. those folks have decided, you know, okay, well, I might might try it. So why not get the car set up correctly? Yeah. Okay. Well, think... after the um, the show airs, there's going to be a lot of interest in the Mazda Miata. Um, with that said, um, budget wise, or how would you lead them into um, picking a chassis? Because I know there's, you know, the N A, B, and C. Are are there ways to where it's like, you know, you know how much to have to kind of find that donor car or the price point for them to get into hell i got i i've got a better uh solution to what you're asking because i based off what you just said if i gave them a scenario mm -hmm. right and the scenario is helm's never been on a track yeah he barely knows okay. how to drive stick shift okay, okay. excuse that's okay <laughs> hey, that's okay it's a scenario i'm gonna learn i'm gonna learn on you heard me. how many gonna, how many stick shift cars do you have one no i had only one you had yeah yeah okay so anyways <laughs> i was saying barely knows how to drive stick shift okay <laughs> But has always expressed an interest in driving on a track. Okay. Okay. So he's like, I want to get out there. What would you guys suggest for a car for Helm to go to the track for the very first time with zero experience? And what and, would that and for me, I own classics. And so what I would like to do is kind of 
um, have that first chassis, the NA. Mm -hmm. Is that? Why don't you stop talking and uh, let me let them. No, no, no. I know, but I want. <laughs> no, you just pose a question to him. So I want. I, I need. To they might the say premise. you might need a new chassis. You don't no, know. No, but them, I want. I want the old chassis. But you don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, you no. have zero experience. No, no. So but I like that. I, I like the. Old, no, you know, reason why I say the old one is because I saw an episode of Jay Leno. Mm -hmm. He, he talked about one. that first one where it was the last of the manual. I don't know how he described, but that that year the of the Miata was the last manual where it's like you know the roll down windows and nothing was electronic to it, and he loved that um, that model and that chassis. Yeah. You know? yeah. Maybe they might suggest an automatic man, um, Miata for you. <laughs> 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 let, let, so let's see yeah. what the, what yeah, the answer yeah, no, will I'm be for putting you in a in a yeah, car. Yeah, no, that's on the longest cool. question ever from West of Tulsa. <laughs> yes, sorry. It's going to be the first generation NA. He, he was right. Yeah. 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 He, 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 he picked the right car. Uh, it, for us, I mean, per, personal preference, I mean, it's, it, you got good taste. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, personal Don't preference, it, it's just, uh, that's the car that we've always raced. It's it's the car, I mean, I, we've owned a bunch of different uh, makes and, or let's say makes and models, but di different generations of the car, and we've always gone back to the NA. The NA is our workhorse car. That's our R&D car. Uh, I have an NA separately from that. That's my daily driver car. He has an NA that's his separate daily driver car. They're, and those three cars that I mentioned, they're completely different from one mm, another. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what it is about that car. Maybe it's just because it's it's the classic one. Yeah. And when you think of Miata, you know, that's that's the one you think of. You think of the pop-up light car. Yeah. You think of that big mm. happy smile on yeah. the front yeah, of the yeah, car. Yeah, yeah, so, right. so if he found one on Facebook Marketplace or whatever and he said, hey, guys, I have this car. What could you guys do to it to help? ensure that i don't die and i have a good time on the track what would you guys do to that st that first gen miata well first thing to do would be to put a roll bar in the car um just for safety regulations to mm -hmm. be on a racetrack anything that doesn't have anything that has a removable top should have or oh. has to have a, a, a roll bar in it okay oh, okay um that would be number one uh you can go out there with a completely factory stock tires 14 inch wheels you know stock brakes you're not going to be very fast but you can go out there and still have fun. See? Um, wow. But like I said before, I mean, it's budget dependent on, on how far you're going to go. I mean, you could put $5,000 in the car and, and get the car set up pretty well. Um, I don't know that it's going to be super, super competitive, but, you know, it's a good start to get the but car. For a first time driver who's never been on the track, they could, you would you recommend going out in a stock yeah. Miata? Oh, yeah. 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 And, uh, and I think what's good about that is they can now start to realize the progression. So if they can continue to go down that road, they can actually see where the improvements are and be like, oh, wow, and start learning as far as what parts is they, they yeah. uh, can add to it, change to it, and then sort of their driving ability, start realizing the, uh, the feedback cool. on, on that part of it. Wow. As you get more comfortable figuring yeah. out, you know, or if you're working with somebody or if you just kind of want to have that experience of being able to you know, better improve the car, better brakes, better tires, better wheels, yeah. better suspension, you know, that sort of thing, you, you, that's how you learn. Yeah. You learn by doing. Because I personally believe that one of the best real-wheel drive cars to go learn um, – on the track is with is, is, is a Miata. You mm -hmm. don't need a lot of power. Mm -hmm. They're fairly cheap, mm -hmm. you know, relatively speaking, and they're reliable. Mm -hmm. You know, because I know that's a big thing for you, Helm, is oh, no, reliability. Yeah. You know, yeah, exactly. Obviously, I don't care about because I own a bunch of rotaries, so you know, reliability. Has, <laughs> if it you know, if it leaks, it's good. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, but um, you know, that's why I feel like you know, for anybody listening to this or watching the show. Um, that's interested in getting on the track and because our previous guest uh, Jeffrey Wil uh, Wilhelm was talking about getting back into teaching and I was like that's a huge thing because the best time I ever had on the track was when I learned how to drive on a fairly stock car because um, technique obviously as you guys know matters more than anything else really mm -hmm. and safety of course but um, that's why you know we put somebody like Helm who's never been on the track and I think it would change the game for him sure. for very little money in, to get in oh, yeah. exactly. you know yeah. what what is the yeah. going uh, uh par for like the price like you know to find a, a actual car um for the na so uh if you don't care about special color special model that sort of thing low mi like low mileage something that's going to be very average yeah i would say right now uh the nas are probably somewhere around seven or eight thousand really yeah something that's like that's sort of average i mean they're they're definitely is stuff that's below average but you're going to yeah. get what you pay yeah, for yeah, yeah. yeah and it may be three four five six different colors wow. it may have two three hundred thousand miles it'll end up in your shop it'll pro yeah <laughs> we'll probably see it but uh you know it may have some safety concerns i mean the stuff oh, that you'll okay. have to put into it to to get it to the point where you feel confident and you know 
get it on the track so that it's it's safe. Yeah, uh, that you'll make it a whole day and, and probably be able to drive the car home. Right. And that's another big thing. A lot of our customers that have the dual purpose cars, they're driving the cars to the track, yeah. on the track, and then driving them back home. And that's the old way of doing it. That yeah. was the old that's hot cool. rodder way well, of doing it. Grassroots. Yeah. Last time I was at, at Streets of Willow, saw a couple of Miata guys, and they strapped their their race tires on yeah. the back on top that's of the truck. Cool. You know, with a ratchet oh, strap, and it's like, uh, hey. Mad props for driving your car to the track. I trailered mine, but yeah. you know, it's. I think it's pretty cool that you know <laughs> they fit. They somehow fit four tires. Wow, on their car. Yeah, yeah. that that kind of speaks to what I had mentioned before: is durability and reliability. That's yeah. what you see yeah. in the Mazda Miata, and that's why there are so many people from so many different backgrounds that like those cars because they're affordable. Uh, maybe a little bit less affordable today than they were, you know, yeah. five years ago, sure. ten years ago. But they are still affordable to uh, do the maintenance on it, whether it's you doing it or you're taking it to the shop. It's still less expensive than you would pay for if you had a 1990 Corvette. Mm. It's going to be still a whole lot. Yeah. Yeah. Less. Right. yeah absolutely. Yeah. That's cool. I mean, I know we, we've been talking about hot rodding. Mm-hmm. And Helm, you've been busy. You were talking to a bunch of hot rodders. Oh, yeah. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, last weekend, um, I had a chance to go to Auto Air Books in Bourbon, California, and to meet um, Tony Baker, who's going to be an uh, upcoming guest on the West of Tulsa Which we're show. excited about. Yeah. yeah, we're definitely excited. So he's the author of um, uh, uh, the history of the San Fernando um, hot rodding scene. And so they put out that book. And I let him know that I was going to come out to represent us and to get a book signed by him. And not knowing that when I walked in, all the original Road Kings, Burbank Road Kings were there, official founders, mm-hmm. um, in addition to other, you know, key instrumental people in the uh, car industry. So, um, yeah, it was a it was a fun day uh, to meet all of them, get the book signed. And we're looking forward to having Tony Baker, uh, Bob Moravez, um, as well as his son and. And maybe one of the episodes we could show maybe a close up shot of the of the book on page ninety two. But um, Ed Pink actually signed our uh, book as well. So well, and, and Gabe, cool. you put some you put some photos out on socials on some yeah, of the yeah, socials yeah, yeah. about Helm, that meeting. Helm right? got some pictures uh, yeah. that we put. Uh, Helm took some pictures with uh, Bob Mervez and Tony Baker, yeah. and um, I don't know if we have one of um, Ed on there, but. We might. Oh yeah, we do. Yeah, we but do. he's basically ha- hanging out with um, all the Road Kings, the Burbank Road That's Kings, exciting. which is and, and really it was cool. amazing. It was amazing. Talk about the connection to Singer too. Oh yeah, um, that's pretty interesting. Well, Ed Pink, um, uh, his his builds is well, what Singer uses the platform to build all their Porsche engines. And so speaking with his son, who works for Singer, uh, it was amazing to kind of see the genesis as well, where his sons, um, uh, you know, kind of like. Um, jump into the car industry was definitely the hot rodding scene because of his dad but then now he's you know he's always been in the automotive world but now he's with this one of the biggest uh you know bespoke companies to build um awesome porsches and so um it was nice to speak to him and actually if i was there just about 10 minutes longer um jay leno actually showed up after oh. and but i had to go i had to head out to torrance um but he stopped in so it was it was a it was a cool outing Sure. So I, I definitely recommend everybody if if you guys haven't been to that um, bookstore in Burbank, it's really great, cool, great yeah. for automotive. I think it's one of the last bookstores yeah. that contains. I mean, from their magazine section to books, aviation, automobile, new and old. Yeah, new and old. It's yeah. amazing. And shop. it's Aero Books. Uh, yeah, Auto, Auto, Auto Aero Books. Books. Auto Aero Auto Books. Books Aero Books. Which, okay. which you know, shout out to Tina, um, the owner of the bookstore. She's the one that kind of connected us with Tony Baker. But she would love to for us to come out to the bookstore to interview them. Yeah, so, we'll definitely do our show yeah. up there for so, sure. So, so but, that's a preview of a show we have coming yeah, up. There. That's yeah, why yeah, I wanted yeah. Helm to talk about. We were talking about but, hot rodding. Hey, and all you know, that. we're on this hot rodding tip. Again, we forgot to do the question. Oh, uh, you know, yeah. and I thought about it when when, when they were talking. Because, <laughs> you know, we're not professionals here, folks. We, we, I'm a half we hour always late forget the question. Yeah. Every episode, we forget it. Pretty you know, much. Gotta, I need cue cards. That's what. <laughs> Otherwise, I for, and I forgot to do the tip line off the top too. Uh, well, oh well, whatever. See, I'm breaking all yeah. these freaking <laughs> rules. Yeah, Live right. and learn. But yeah. the question is, would you guys drive to when to drive down to West of Tulsa? Would you guys drive? Yada. Let's hope a Miata. Of course. Oh, yeah. okay. oh. what, what kind? What did we drive? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, drive. Miata. Well, what, <laughs> what, which Miata, what year, what? Um... So it's uh, a we want 90, all the specs, 94 uh, Montego Blue uh, M edition. Uh, so it's got the uh, Nardi steering wheel 
uh, Nardi shifter mm. and uh, the hand grip uh, or brake grip. It's got the uh, C package on it, so it's got uh, the tan interior, uh, air conditioning, mm. stereo. It's 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 the big is, deal. So, is that the so NAB? Na NA. 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 Oh, NA. So first generation. It's the first uh, M edition, like official M edition car that had come out. I'm gonna stop you. It wasn't. It wasn't. What about the British Racing Green? That that's was the first one. That's not an M edition. Okay. Yeah. All right. Anyways, he, he's got well, me on that. So, anyways, so, so, so <laughs> with the with the M editions um, from Mazda, um, the Nardi steering wheel stock from the factory. Mm -hmm. Oh wow! So they had like a, a Nardi package. So some of the cars, so it has a Nardi shift knob, and then mm. I don't. It has a wood grip that I don't know is Nardi. Um, but it's it's just part of like the wood package that was for it. We'll get some photos uh, they of make, you guys. Oh, with yeah. the car. they made it. They made it very premium. Had like chrome cool. uh, door sills, and then the tan leather interior. It looks like a completely different car. Mm. If you comp were to compare a A package, which is bare bones, uh, manual windows, manual mirrors, um, no air conditioning, no power steering. Uh, I think a cassette player. It was very basic. Hmm. Is that your car or is that uh, it's my car? It's car. Your, oh. it's car. Is that your, yes, your daily? Obviously, you're not tracking that car. No, I'm not tracking it. You know, I, I believe in, you know, walking the talk. And if I can't sort of convey that by also driving a car, then I shouldn't be out there promoting it. Okay. So you have two Miatas. That's one of them. And the other one's your track car. Uh, no, the other one is, is well, it, it is kind of a track car, yeah. Okay. It, when I say kind of a track car, yeah, I do use it for the track purposes. Uh, I don't use it as a daily driver, so okay. you're right. And then you also have your hot rods. Yeah, well, I have a, a Corvette, uh, which is a 1964 that's kind of all redone, and it looks like the Grand Sport. Mm. Um, and then I've also, uh, well, I shouldn't say I also. My wife has a, a 71 442. Oh, Ooh, yeah. So Okay. Uh, and I, I, this guy made me get rid of my uh, 74Z28 because he said I didn't drive it, which is kind of true. But and we also <laughs> were, I, we were also running into issues with one of our neighbors that every time it started up, she would come out and start oh, yelling yeah. at me, this you car's know, too loud. In, she wasn't a hot rider. In Ryan's defense, <laughs> in Ryan's defense, I'll back him up on that because I feel like if you don't drive a car, that's drivable. Because I have plenty of cars that are not drivable that I would like to drive. But if you have a car that's drivable and you don't drive it, what's the point of having it? Because, you know, unless you're a car collector, which I don't think you guys are collector. You guys like driving your cars. Yeah. Um, if you don't drive it, you might as well let somebody else drive it, you know. And uh, that's just my personal take on it. Don't shoot me in the comments <laughs> below. But um, I feel like if you're not a collector, you should be driving all your cars at least once in a blue moon. If you don't drive them... Get yeah. rid of them and get yeah. something else that you no, want. And, and I agree with you that, and that was one of the reasons why I let, when I let it go, I didn't feel that sort of. Oh God, I'm gonna yeah. eat this. Um, you know, I I knew that it was gonna go to a good home and that somebody was gonna uh, drive yeah. it and, and yeah. enjoy it. So when she came out and yelled at you, was it like reliving your childhood, <laughs> your your teenage years of the, the hot well, she, rods where you piss <laughs> off every neighbor? Uh, it kind of felt good, didn't it? Uh, you know, it, it, I, it, in our neighborhood, I always try to be respectful for everyone that's around there. And I, I felt kind of bad, but after she walked away, I was thinking to myself, damn, I still love this car. And I rubbed it a couple more times. Yeah, there you go. There you go. That's funny. <laughs> and what about you, Ryan? What, uh, what cars are you, is in your garage or stable there? Uh, so obviously Miata. Uh, so I have a, a daily driver Miata that's a, a 92 uh, that's a really special car uh, for a lot of reasons. The car itself is special because it's a 92 Sunburst yellow. Uh, mm -hmm. It's bright yellow, and uh, it's special because the car, uh, they only made 1,500 of them, so it's one of that car, and it, at the time when the car had come out, it was, it was special, and nobody wanted the yellow. So a lot of dealerships had to special order them and then they got stuck with them. Mm. And uh, it was it was just it was just kind of funny. But uh, that's my daily driver car. Uh, our workhorse car, our R&B car is a 97 Miata, which is still the same body style. Uh, it's the very last year of the N.A. Um, that's our, our workhorse car that we made a um, wide body kit for. It has a fastback top on it, so it doesn't really look like a Miata. I get a lot of people that ask me if it's an RX-7 or a Porsche or something that's not Miata, mm -hmm. and I just say, yeah. <laughs> that, that is whatever you think it is, because it doesn't have any badges on it. It doesn't look like a Miata. It's the, the wide body kit that's on the car. I think the rears are 
I don't know, like five inches bigger than factory. Wow. It, it's it's the ten inch uh, wheels all the way around. It's it's. Are you running spacers on that to get no. the? Oh, so you just run a red low offset wheel. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah they're uh, they're really really low offset workmeisters. Nice, uh, they're very, good very choice cool. of wheel. Good yeah, choice. Five and a half inch lips. There, it's it it looks it looks exactly how it's supposed to. It looks exactly how we intended the car to look. Nice. Um, and that car, uh, we have a bunch of stuff that we did to that car as well as far as engine wise too. Um, the suspension was modeled after a car that was successful in Japan, um, from JIC Magic, which was cool. Um, the uh, engine has uh, some engine parts from uh, a company in Japan that we're working with, uh, called Maruha. Um, that's got cams and they make a, a bunch of different stuff for it. Um, and it also has a road truck supercharger kit that's on the car. Mm. Uh, that's something that we put together that we're hoping to make it a regular production piece. Okay. Um, but it's it's a pretty it's a pretty wild car it, car and it's it's very weird to go between those two cars yeah. and drive the very plain daily car and then to drive that one because. They don't really share anything other than the name on the the title. <laughs> Pretty much that. Yeah. Um, and then I also have a, a '69 Camaro that he had mentioned earlier. Mm. Uh, that's a car that uh, we I, I'll put it back together at some point. That's that's where that car lives right now. <laughs> <laughs> so it's in pieces, is what it is. Uh, yeah, okay. we yeah. I had this brilliant idea of of uh, trying to create a kit for uh, some brake and suspension parts that didn't exist. Uh, what I wanted to do was so it's a '69 car, and I wanted to update the wheel bearings in the car to have uh, sealed bearing uh, wheel bearings. And what I found is we were able to combine certain things to create a kit for to for the 69 factory arms to use um c5 corvette hubs so instead of having to pack wheel bearings and grease and yeah. deal with all that if the wheel bearings go out you unbolt them out throw them away yeah. bolt into new ones and then you're back on the road yeah uh, and then with that it also uses all c5 brake pieces so anything that would be from uh, C5, C6, C7 is all applicable to that. Oh, cool. And that's something that we're kind of working on behind the scenes, but that that's partially the reason. More R and D. More R and D. It never ends. It, it definitely <laughs> definitely never ends. I find it very um, um, interesting because you're talking about your neighbor that you know didn't like your loud Z28. Um, having a shop in Goleta, and if you don't know where Goleta is, it's it's Santa Barbara, basically, or right outside of Santa Barbara. Um, Having a shop, I mean, I'm finding more and more, especially like with Mariah Motorsports and these other guys, there's a lot of, I, I mean, I don't know if, if you guys are the only two, but there's a shop that actually works on cars in Goleta or Santa Barbara County. Um, are there many shops like that? Because I find that very rare. That's when uh, CJ told me about you guys. I'm like, there's a shop in <laughs> Goleta? I'm like, of all places? I'm yeah. like, I don't know. Is that kind of, are you guys kind of like rare or is that? I, I think we are rare in, in some respects. First of all, uh, just to kind of pinpoint our location, we are across from the Santa Barbara airport. And if you go back in history, yeah. they did a tremendous amount of road racing out yeah. there. And that was kind of uh, the tipping point in our decision to be able to set up there. We wanted to kind of uh, be, you know, in a place that we felt this Some this history, vibe, right? Some yeah, history. And, yeah. and good feelings there. So yeah. sure and, and we... Uh, we've we've been uh, very successful. I'm sorry. Oh, sure. Uh, what about? Uh, yeah, we we even did a, a commemoration uh, towards uh, that. We designed a shirt that had uh, the track on the back of it, and oh, cool. uh, it it said on the top of it, "Faster than uh, Riverside." Riverside, which yeah. which it, which it was. Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, but man. but anyways, uh, going back to your original question, as far as uh, are we unique in that, I would have to say. In some respects, yeah. I, you know, a lot of the places that used to be there, uh, like Mariah, uh, they aren't in the same fashion that they had originally started off. Yeah. So Mariah's kind of uh, morphed into something else, which I'm not really sure. Yeah, I think they're rotary engineering now. Um, I think uh, they do. They, they, I think they split split the company with the body kits and then the actual race tuning that they they've done. Um, Brandon, don't shoot me if I'm wrong, but um, that's my yeah, understanding of yeah, them. something like that. They they're they're not uh, like what they used to yeah, be yeah, under correct, the, correct. the previous owner. Yeah, and then uh, um, Bob Jenks, uh, which used to build motors for a lot of the, oh, yeah. the hot rodders back there, he's gone. Uh, Chip yeah. Foos, uh, yeah. he's moved out Sam, of there, the Foos, yeah, the Sam, Foos yeah. family. Yeah. Uh, so, so there's really not any of those guys that are into you know building horsepower, except for us and maybe 
there might be uh, that we're unaware of. There might be one, maybe two other places there, but they're not as uh, uh, visual or they're sure. not as, as 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 out there as we are. Sure. Well, and I do know there's some shops um, in the Santa Barbara area, Galita area, where they're not open to the public, but they do that stuff. Okay. Mm. So they're more private. They do it for their own enjoyment, their own fun. Yeah. Um, but Where's they're the full blown shops. Where's the fun of that? I can't, but they, but I they can't don't go take there any customers. And get my yeah. on, man. No, they work on their own cars. <laughs> <Just kidding. Yeah. laughs> so, yeah. uh, but there are a few of those. In fact, what we're touching on here is one of the topics that we've had the most comments on in our social media. Yeah. What, what was the the one was Dana Newquist when we had him on talking the about silence, how these trades are decline yeah. of trades yeah. in automotive trades and uh, who will work on them, who won't. Yeah. yeah um, so we're, there's a huge debate. Uh, dis- I want to call it a debate, but a discussion, mm-hmm. um, heated on, discussion on, on, in on, some respect in one of our videos yeah. that uh, where Dana talks about how a lot of these trades uh, and restoration of cars has gone body guys and uh, electronic guys and so on and so forth. And um, it sounds to me that uh, you might have touched on this a little bit have you guys seen that uh, decline of is getting harder and harder to find people to do um whether it be tuning engine building paint interior do are you guys finding that as well so for our business i i honestly believe that we're we're very niche and there's people uh at least in my opinion i I think he'll agree with me there's people who, who will say that they do that kind of work and uh, maybe they do, but the quality or level of quality that we kind of expect is maybe different. And we may have different ideas on what that thing is. So having the same idea is not always the same thing. And Some uh, guys may be going for a show car and you guys are doing more practical, you know, get in the car and go. Yeah, or vice versa. Or vice versa. And, yeah. and, and that's that's the thing that may, might be kind of tough. But in the time that we've been in business, we've definitely seen a, a fair amount of businesses go away. Mm-hmm. And um, that's that's always tough to see because, you know, you want everybody, you know, everybody that's doing business legitimately to, to survive, you yeah. know, and do and, and continue to be a resource for other people to be out there and, and, and provide the service that they can and, and help everybody and do those things yeah um but as far as uh people that are out there i mean i think forever there there's people that are out there that that will say that they do you know the, the kind of work that that we do um but i don't know to what extent or what sort of quality and and we're doing like a paint job for example we don't do paint mm-hmm. just this is going to be outside of us but doing a paint job you know, it's not uh, it there's different levels of doing it where you know you could have you know a show car or you could do like a race car paint job, and a race car paint job really is just you're just covering the car with a color. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's not it's not it's a nice car. It's gonna get banged it's, up it's, anyway. Yeah, exactly, yeah. it's gonna yeah. get damaged. So it's yeah. it's not something that you're really concerned about it being nice and shiny. And you know to say that that like you're a painter for example, you know, on what end of the spectrum are you? And I don't know if that answers your question. But, no, no, it does. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's a, it, it's something you can sit here. We can sit here all day long and talk about that topic. Oh, yeah. there's so many nuances to it, and there's so many moving parts and pieces. But yeah, I, I think just going back to that question, uh, I think part of it is uh, education. The schools have kind of changed as far as what they're targeting. Everything is you know computers, programming, that sort of thing. And I think in our area, the only high school that actually has an automotive program is uh san marcus san marcus yeah. and i've yeah. seen it and i mean it's it's almost a part-time thing i don't yeah. think it's always yeah. i mean you'll see a car is parked up and you'll see it the gates locked but there aren't mm-hmm. always people in there so i'm not sure what the story is yeah. about that. and I, I think the other side of it is in in getting involved in what we do you got to be passionate about it yeah. because it's not easy work and if you think it is i mean you see the car after it's done and everything it looks cool and you look at the detail and you think wow but actually getting the car there, it's a lot of work, a lot of dirty work, greasy work, and a lot of people don't want to do that anymore. And maybe that's what you're kind of seeing. But I've also, you know, I, I do a lot of reading and I also see that, you know, the the blue collar worker guy, he's coming back. And, you know, is, is that, you know, what we do is blue collar work? I don't really know and I don't really care. I just love what I do. And uh, I, I would like to see more people that are passionate like that. You know, give me someone who's passionate. I'll figure out how to train that person to do what the, what I do. And that's the key. That's the key. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. cool. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. very cool. Uh, <clears throat> Kevin Haberly, he, you know, with Hot Rod Project, he was talking about this too, yeah, about t- how yeah. the yeah. trades have gone away from schools, you know. And <clears throat> you said that because uh, out of high school you went to a trade school yep. to, for automotive, right? Yep. I think that's a huge thing. I think there needs to be more people like that because we've been so conditioned to like 
go to the four year college and that didn't work out for me. Um, and like other people that I know too, you know, where they could have just gone into, you know, a trade or go work for a company or whatever. There's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. Many paths to that, you know? Yeah. So I think that's good that you touched on that. Yep. All right. Well, guys, thank you so much for coming in. Driving Absolutely. up Thank the 101 to come see us, or actually driving down the 101 to come see us from Galita. <laughs> yep. I always get that backwards. Yeah, the yeah. driving part is always yeah. something that I enjoy doing when I'm behind the wheel of a car. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, you ask me to go all the way up. If you're if if the location was all the way up in San Francisco, I'd You'd have my hand there. up. Okay, I'll, I'll be right. there. <laughs> I love it. I love I, it. Can I just add, I forgot to ask We know, we, I think you ran out of I your admit, time there, Helm. No, I'm joking. Go ahead. No, go ahead. This, I, wanted to, I wanted to ask this question in the beginning, but we had just a, a lot of uh, awesome questions before that. But what is the meaning behind Miata? Well, uh, like, it's probably what, Jinba. It's a, a name. It's a name. Yeah. And what it, what it represents, and this is the concept that they had used to kind of develop it, it's horse and man, putting them together. Oh. And that's kind of what the idea was behind the Miata. No, oh, I didn't know that. that. that yeah. Interesting. Well, Good question. Good way to wrap you, it up there. Yeah. We didn't wait an I hour to ask I, that. I haven't been here in a while, so that's why, you know, I'm trying <laughs> yeah, to get up I, to I just want to make sure that I said it right. It's Jinba Ite. Jinba Ite. Yeah. Nice. Wow. Good question. You saved the best for last there, Helm. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you got to join and us also, more and, often. And, 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 well, no, I, I, I miss being here. But also, too, it, you may, you inspired me to kind of look in because you're talking about how they did um, various color uh, ways. And I'm like, the only Miata I used to see was like a, a you know, tan and maybe black and red. But now you're, you know, I want to kind of research and see what kind of color ways they did. Ooh, uh, Miata yeah. for Helm soon, maybe? Mm -hmm. uh, they, they, Dude, hey, they, but, but, can you make, can you convert a Miata to a wagon? <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a wagon guy. You know, anything is possible. Yeah, it, 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 it already is missing the top, so it's just <laughs> <we're> putting <laughs> another top Hey, we need to stretch it. Yeah. You, 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 you say that, and we kind of laugh about it, but there are companies out there that are rebodying Miatas with Corvettes, with you know, C two C two Corvettes, and I'm not saying that it's it's exactly the same size. It's it's shrunk down. Fifty seven Chevys I've seen wow. uh, on Corvettes, what? and and wow. it, it it's cool. And it, I you know I honestly believe it goes back to those three uh, words, which is dependability, quality, and reliability. When you have that as your base or foundation for your vehicle, you can put anything on it and still enjoy being totally. you know fifty seven Chevy guy, you know, or That's a Corvette cool. person. Yeah. yeah, and and also one last thing uh, to touch on is uh, the colors. Yeah. So they only came out when they originally came out with uh, the Miata was in blue, red, or white. That's all you could get. And I it's, remember it's, those. It's yeah. interesting how they expanded, and that's why I say I believe they looked at what we were doing in the seventies and and understanding the different color combinations, and boom, it exploded from there and. The and do you think there's any meaning behind red, white, and blue? It's the flag. The when U.S. sending flag. it to the U.S. Yeah, it could yeah. have been. It could it France. It's France. It was... oh. <laughs> 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 the are French you, love me out of Are you, are you <laughs> thinking Peugeot? We haven't had a Peugeot <laughs> show, just, show yeah, yet. Uh, did, did you just, this is a random fact I'm just going to throw out there. Did you guys know that the, the first prototype for the Miata was in Santa Barbara? They no. tested it in Santa Barbara? Yeah. Really? really? Yeah. No, yeah, I did not know. That. There's a bunch of there's a bunch of pictures of it in in Santa Barbara, and it it it's a right hand drive. It doesn't totally look like the production car, but yeah, they tested it originally. It was they were going to test it in Santa Monica? Wow. I think it was Santa Monica. Um, but they they were originally going to do it there, and they brought it to Santa Barbara because they figured there'd be less press. It didn't really work out that way, but <laughs> yeah, the original prototype they they tested it in Santa Barbara. It's a great place to test out a convertible. Yeah. What was the yeah, first year for the NA? Uh, 89. Oh, 89. Yeah. To 97. Uh, to 97. Nice. Okay. Correct. Well, he's catching on. You're he's not going to be a Miata guy. I think you've converted him. Wagon. We're he won't find an 89. <laughs> you won't, uh, <laughs> Maybe. Are the 89s d difficult to find? Uh, it was like a like a pre-production year. So like the technically it's a 90, but there are 89 VIN number or um, like uh, production dates on in the doors. So wow, it is okay. 89 to, ni to 97. I, I take it those are valuable but, if you can find one that's... Uh, the first no. year actually is like probably the least valuable. The, the first really? year had some uh, uh, catastrophic engine issues. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. what they say with most most cars. Your first year, you don't yeah, want to buy it. The bugs, yeah. are and then they updated well, it for ninety one to. So there were a bunch of different engine uh, variations. So uh, the first uh, year, first 
a couple of years. So 90 to 93 was 1.6 and then 94 to 97 was 1.8. And then they changed it again after that. But the 91 late to 93 was the fixed 1.6. The 90 was the one that had the catastrophic okay. engine. By now, probably most of those have been sorted out, you would think. I would right? hope so. Yeah. Uh, we, we've seen, you probably we've seen see a few. Yeah, we've, <laughs> we've seen them. They're like, I don't know. Show my car only has 40,000 miles. I don't know why it doesn't work anymore. Yeah. Don't you know you don't buy the first year yeah, of a yeah, yeah, yeah. or any car? For I got them. such a good deal on it. Yeah, but yeah. you need an engine now. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, Ralph Ryan, thank you so much. R and R Motorsports. If you're not, how, how can uh, or MotorWorks? I almost said Motorsports uh, because I got sports in my head. So MotorWorks. But if people want to reach you guys, how, how can they reach you? Uh, three ways: uh, social media, or on Facebook and also Instagram. Um, you can call us. Uh, number 805-845-8750 or you go to our website which is r and r no um, let me uh take that back the website is the address is uh, rrmotorworks.com yeah. perfect or you can follow yeah, us yeah. on instagram uh rr underscore motorwork uh yeah they got me messed up now. <laughs> I was like, hold on uh it's it's rr underscore motorworks on instagram and we're gonna in a minute here as soon as we wrap this up we're gonna take a picture we're gonna post it on our socials right Picture of what? Selfie. Of us, selfie. just all yeah. together. Yeah, yeah. 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 And so we'll tag We forgot it to do it one time. I know, I know. That was my fault, probably. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Jeffrey. All right. Again, thanks, guys, for joining us. Really learned a ton about Miata's. Had so much fun. Yes. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Go Thank you guys now. for yeah. inviting us. We, we enjoyed awesome. the day. Yeah. It, was, yeah. it was awesome. Okay, good. All right. So don't forget, like, follow, subscribe. We have our YouTube channel. Thank you very much. And we appreciate you listening, watching on whatever platform you're watching and listening on. And we will see you west of Tulsa.